Pastor didn't announce that I was going to be speaking tonight because he wanted, he wanted Fred to show up. In fact, he didn't even tell me so I would show up. <laughs> uh, we're looking in Deuteronomy 27. I want to read a few verses in here and then give some uh, remarks. Deuteronomy 27, starting at verse 11. And Moses charged the people the same day, saying, These shall stand upon Mount Gerizim and bless the people uh, when ye are come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. And these shall stand upon Mount Ebal and curse Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel uh, with a loud voice. And then he goes on with some cursings on there, and we'll look at them uh, briefly. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. Father, we know that these things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Father, they're given to us as warnings so that we don't fall into the same pitfalls that we've seen other people fall into. And Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that dwells in every born-again believer and guides us into all truth. We pray that everything that is done and said here today will, first of all, bring honor and glory to you, magnify your name, edify the believer, and convict the lost. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this is the book of Deuteronomy. It's called the Second Law. Sometimes they call it that because it's, it seems like a reiteration. It is not. God doesn't put anything in there just to fill up space. Uh, you have that in the book of uh, Proverbs. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but in the end thereof are the ways of death. You have that in there twice. I think it's in 14 and 16 in chapter. God just doesn't fill up space. He's given us warnings. And sometimes you repeatedly warn your kids or somebody warns you about something that you might do that will bring danger and you can't see it and they can. Uh, so God gives us warnings in the Old Testament about this. Now, the reason why, and I, I think it's an honor uh, to be able to speak, uh, this is the last Sunday of uh, 2018. Uh, God was the one that initiated and set up time. Time is marked so we can have an understanding that we're just passing through. And we only have a limited amount of time. In eternity, our life is measured in James as a vapor. What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. When you go on out in the cold and you breathe and you can see that vapor and it's gone right away, that's the way that God says, in, in, in light of eternity, that's all your life is. And with that, God has given us a tremendous gift. And I, I'll hammer this as much as I can. But God has given us a tremendous gift. And that is the opportunity to live by faith. It doesn't seem like a pleasant thing to live by faith. I would rather live by fact. I would rather see everything uh, 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 set up before me and I know that it's all taken care of down the road. God doesn't do that. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. So, and where do we get faith? Is it because we hear some speaker and we get charged up and we say, you know what, I'm going to start living by faith. You'll never get it that way. That won't carry you past, as soon as you start talking after the service, that's just going to dissipate. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is a tangible substance. And you say, well, that's just your thought. No, it's God's. Now, faith is the thank you. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We walk on God's faith every day. God didn't take dirt from somewhere in the far regions of space and form it into a ball and call it earth. You know how we got this earth here? He spoke it into existence. Amen. That is God's faith. Amen. That's God's faith. That's tangible. And we have God's faith given to us here. You know, when you get right down to it, the authority of the word of God is God. Now you have to come to a, a, a very simple conclusion. When you consider the word of God, either God is the all-existing 
ever existing, eternal God, or we got here by a mistake. Now, if you, we got here by a mistake, and that, that Big Bang Theory was just fomented by a Catholic priest back in the late 19th century. They didn't think about that before that. The Big Bang, they didn't call it that, but then it was developed into that. Now, just common sense would tell you that if there was an explosion, first of all, and very elementary, who made the explosives? I mean, nothing explodes. I mean, nothing can, you know, and then, and, I, and I've said this before, and I'm not trying to be clever, but when we talk to people on the street, and especially around uh, U of M or any college area that, and uh, they certainly are indoctrinated in evolution. They certainly are. I mean, they, they're just told one thing, and, they, and, they'll, and they'll give them a, a lesson in philosophy, in psychology, in mathematics, in, in home economics, if they have it in college, and they will, say, they will say, that is black. And you say, no, it's not, it's white. But it's like the emperor's new clothing, and nobody wants to be a fool in front of the professor, so at the end of the day, you know what they'll say? That's black. I mean, they're just, it's just stupid. It's, it's, it's perpetuated by itself. Now, you have to come, and I'll say to these people, I say, well, look, and, and I, I could drag this out, and I'm not going to. I'm not trying to be clever, and I'm not trying to waste time. But I'm saying, if, if an unintelligent cosmic explosion, and that's what evolution is, it's begins with unintelligence. If, it's, if you, there's not even a, a fragment of intelligence there, because if there was, that's deity. So if unintelligence can create life, then how come intelligence can't keep it? Right? I mean, you can tie your shoes, you know? I mean, they used to make shoes with laces, but you can drive, well, you don't have to be real smart to drive today. I mean, I've been on a road. But, uh, but I'm just saying, there's a measure of intelligence that, that we live in today. And if that is anything at all, it is much greater than what evolution produces when it says nothing produce something. So if evolution, if nothing can produce life, and none of us want to die, I mean, you're here on Wednesday nights and you hear all these prayer requests, and most of them are for medical needs, and I understand that, but most of them, why don't we have, and, I, and I'll say this to people also on a, uh, in the college campuses if we can, if the if, 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 uh, Lord leads me and, it, and the situation turns that way, I say, look, over here we have, and that's at U of M Hospital, and if you've ever driven by there, it is a major complex. I don't want to drive in there, but I've driven by there to get to where we're preaching. It is a huge complex. And, and sometimes I'll see them on Nova, or they'll talk to a, about a doctor, what he said there from U of M, or a professor or something like that, and they're world-renowned. And I say, listen, we don't, uh, we're not uh, affected by... Um, uh, spotted fever anymore, uh, uh, the bubonic plague. I mean, man has come up with, uh, with um, uh, remedies for those, right? I said, how come man hasn't come up with a remedy for death? And he looked at you like, well, you're foolish. But I said, man has come up with a remedy for death. The man Christ Jesus, he tasted death for every man. And if they'll listen, then we can just say the great transaction, the simplicity of the transaction is that God said to the soul that sinneth that shall die, God is immutable, God has to exact death, and you cannot pay for it because you're already tainted. So Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, became sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so he tasted death for every man. And I've said this before. It was, I think, the last time I spoke on a Sunday night here. Do you know what the torment of hell is when Jesus said to the man in Luke 16, the torment of hell is not the fire. He said, I am tormented in this hell. If you were in a building that was burning and I'd say, hey, how you doing? You wouldn't use the word torment. You'd use the word burn. I'm burning in this building, right? Yeah. So what is the torment of hell? It is the gospel. It's the gospel. And the more gospel people hear, the more torment they heap on themselves. And you have that. And I, that isn't my intention to go that way. What we are looking in the book of Deuteronomy is now they are at a turning point in history. This is the last book. This is uh, the, uh, of the Pentateuch. Moses' last book in here. And he is instructing the people as they go into the land. Moses cannot go into the land because he broke the law. And it is, it is 
an evidence of God that the law cannot bring you into the promised land. And the promised land is not a, a picture of heaven. The promised land is a picture of when God took us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he gave us a suit of clothes, which is called the whole armor of God to do warfare. And you have that in the book of Deuteronomy. Amen. You have that. So, so uh, the, the picture there. And, and so now uh, Moses, by inspiration of God, is instructing these people and he's warning them. Now, we, I said that in prayer, and that's in um, uh, Romans 15, 4, that the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. The things that are the word aforetime pertains at that time specifically to the Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi. Because that's what they had in the canon of Scripture. Although Peter, writing about Paul's writing, already included them in Scripture. Now, he said that the things were written aforetime were written for our New Testament, our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Why through patience? Why through patience? We are, we, when we got saved, we were entered into an, a military position where we're constantly at war with the devil. We are. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God pulling down our strongholds and every high and the imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we do that every day. Now, God's equipped us with that and he's given us uh, that light. So when we come through, when, we, when we're going from, uh, when, Paul's, uh, when uh, Moses here is instructing him and he's warning and he gives him some warnings here, it's about going into the promised land. We, and, and, and a lot of us very naively, uh, come into Christianity with the idea that now that I'm saved, everything is coming up roses. It ain't. We are on a battlefield. We're on about, you know, I, I think, I was thinking when, when the pastor was speaking there, and maybe it was one of the songs we were singing there, but, uh, but uh, Martin Luther's anthem, it's not a song, it's an anthem, and we, we really, really do not have the right to sing it today. I mean, because we are living in apostasy, but uh, a mighty fortress is our God. Uh, for still our ancient foe does seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate on earth is not as equal. Did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Does ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he, and he will win the battle. Yeah. Now I'm telling you, that's an anthem. Yeah. That is That was born out of an experience. We just lackadaisically go through our Christianity as if, like, really, God doesn't really care. We are living in apostasy. Yeah. I'm going to use two examples at the end of this here, too, to prove that you do not have to go along with the apostates. You don't have to. You can if you want. You know, any dead fish can float downstream, you know. But it has to, you'll have to go against the current if you're going to uh, live for God. Yeah. Now, we want to look at a few things here, and this is part of studying the Word of God, and this is part of comparing Scripture with Scripture. I mean, it's just a thing to me, and I'm not trying to be clever. I'm not trying to be impressive. I'm just trying to open up our understanding because I'm not going to finish and plumb the depths of all this, but it might start you on a, a, a something too. And I'm not talking about, uh, you know, God, when he put genealog genealogies in the Bible, he put them in there for a reason. And I can't even remember where it is. I think it's in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, I'm not sure. But he talks about the sacrifices that they do over and over. And there's 24 of them, and they're all exactly the same. And uh, Abishadai did this, and 10 uh, silver uh, uh, spoons of, of, of incense and all that. And it's the same thing over. And I'm not minimizing that by saying it uh, uh, half-hearted like that. I'm not. I just don't memorize that. But anyway, but uh, you know what? It's in there. And when you're reading your Bible, you know, Satan will say, well, they're all the same. Why don't you just jump to the next chapter? You can read the name. I think God put it in there to see if we would read it. You know, just honor his word. Now, now it says, and Moses charged the people as same day saying, these shall stand upon, upon Mount Gerizim 
and bless the people uh, when they are come over Jordan, Simeon and Levi and Judah and Issachar and Joseph and Benjamin. Now, there was two mountains when they got into there. They hadn't got into the land yet, but there was two mountains with a valley between them and you could see them. One was Mount Ebal. Now these are testimonies. Mount, one was Mount Ebal and it was to the north of Gerizim. And the other one was Mount Gerizim. Mount Gerizim was lush with vegetation. Same region, same area, same amount of rainfall and everything. Mount Ebal was denuded of any vegetation. And he took six of the tribes and he put them up there. And it's interesting. And, and, I'm, and I'm not, I just, this is something I've thought about for years, just looking at this and everything. Why, why did he pick out these uh, representatives of the tribes to go to the blessing and these to the curse? I, I just wonder why. And I think it, it really has an effect on where we came from too. I'm not sure, uh, and I don't, I don't really even know how to express it. But if you look at this right in here, it says, these shall stand upon Mount Gerizim and bless the people uh, when they are uh, come over Jordan. Simeon and Levi. Now, you go into Genesis and you can see the Simeon and Levi when they're born. And you can see what Leah, these are the children of Leah, and you can see what she said about them. Then you can go to, I think, 49, uh, Genesis 49 or 50, and you can see uh, the prophecy that Jacob gives to these 12 tribes. And it says Simeon and Levi are instruments of cruelty. Now, I really appreciated them. Because when Jacob left uh, Laban, now, he left them under very uh, uh, harsh circumstances. He tricked them out of all of the uh, strong sheep, and the feebler were Laban's, and the stronger were Jacob's. You remember that? He put the strakes in the, in the, in the water troughs and everything, and I really don't know what that means, but they, the, the cattle bear ring straked and speckled and spotted and brown, and they were Jacob's. But they were the stronger ones and the weaker ones. But, but Laban had tricked Joseph, but Joseph had, was a trickster anyway. You know, he, uh, chickens come home to roost for him. Uh, he tricked his brother out of the blessing, but he had a regard for the blessing. So you've got to be encouraged by that. Uh, uh, Esau did not. He did not have a respect for the blessing of God. Jacob did. He wanted it, even if he had to connive to get it. And then when he was tricked, when he thought he was going to marry Rachel, and I love it. It says it seemed but a, he, he agreed to work for her for seven years, and it seemed but a few days for the love that he had for her. And then when he married her, and they were, I guess it was all veiled and everything, he woke up the next morning. It was not Rachel. It was Leah. Boy, was he fit to be tied. And then he had to work another seven years. Then he worked another seven years. And, and, and uh, Laban uh, changed his wages ten times. Then, then he's going, and when he gets away, and he thinks his way is about three days' journeys away, Laban, carry, Laban carries, uh, uh, catches up with him. Now he's afraid of Laban. Laban is coming after him, and he's, not, he's got blood in his eye. Now, when he gets there, but God told Laban the night before, he said, you don't touch him. Don't touch And so Laban, otherwise I think Laban would have killed him and brought his daughters back home. I just think that but anyway uh, then when he gets past that that's one hurdle then Esau Esau swore to kill him his own brother and when he saw him and when he knew he was going there then you know that he wrestles with the angel of the Lord I believe that's a pre-incarnate Christ he wrestles with him and and he and, and, and uh, he he prevailed I don't understand that. I mean, his fear must have been so great, but whatever. But, he, but Jacob prevailed. He walked differently after that. I, I heard a preacher say, you know, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Jacob had a limp after that. He said, you know, when you encounter Christ, you walk differently after right. that. You, and, I, and I appreciated that. Yeah. You walk differently. You know, we're told to have, take to, have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's going to make you walk different. So when... Uh, uh, Jacob, uh, now he's going to, uh, he's, he meets Esau. Esau meets him with 400 men. Now he's really beside himself. So I, I just, I, I see this. He takes the concubine 
uh, kids and puts them up forward. Then he takes Leah's kids and puts them up, and then he puts Rachel in the back. You know, figured that uh, uh, that his brother Esau would get tired of killing before he got to them. To, I guess I don't know. Uh, you know, I mean, but he's he's got a strategy there. But Esau comes and he's happy to see him. And so they go on and he lets him, he said, well, uh, Esau wants to give a bodyguard to go through the land and everything. And he said, no, no. He says, I'm all right. He said, if we overdrive the sheep and all that stuff. So they go to another place and they run into a fellow by the name of Shechem. Shechem falls in love with um, Dinah, his daughter. And she went out to see the people of the land. And he really loved her. The Bible says he was more honorable than his father. Uh, and Hamor, uh, and, and when, and when uh, Levi and Simeon come back, oh man, they are beside themselves because they defiled their own sister. Now, Israel, I mean, in that economy, in that worldwide scope of, of morality, Israel was still God's people. They were ruthless. Uh, they, they were something to be reckoned with. But they were still God's people. So they go, so they come on in there and uh, uh, he says, uh, well, we can't, you know, they want to marry him. And you get that in context there because Hamar, his father, and he's a Hivite. And you want to understand that because God instructed Israel when they went into the land, right? when they went into the land, not to have anything to do with the Hivites. And who was it that came up there wilily and brought their vittles and brought their old shoes? And they were the Jebusites, but they were of the Hivites. And they said, uh, and, and even Joshua says, well, how do we know that you're not among us? And uh, they had that suspicion, you know, and all that. But it says they took of their vittles and they asked not counsel of God. I like that because it's a great warning. You say, should you pray about everything? In all thy ways, acknowledge him, yeah. and he shall direct thy paths. Yeah. It didn't say just in the hard ways, and I like this, and I just thought about it again, and I've said it a number of times. I heard it on the Through the Bible program, J. Vernon McGee. Uh, uh, he used this illustration. He said, uh, uh, a woman went up to the preacher, and she said, uh, Pastor, do you think we should bother God with our small problems? And he said, Madam, do you think that you can mention anything to God that's big? That is great. I mean, that puts things in such perspective for me that everything, everything, he's concerned about everything Amen. in our lives. Amen. Now, so he has these uh, six tribes that go on up there. Uh, there. The four of them, now Leah had four, uh, six children, six sons and one daughter. That's what we're given. Um, now, but uh, uh, Rachel only had two. Uh, it was Joseph and Benjamin. They are there. They're on Mount Gerizim, and they're given the blessings. And he uses uh, Simeon and Levi, who were instruments of cruelty. Now, Levi was, was uh, 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 Moses, and, uh, and um, Aaron came out of the tribe of Levi. We get our book Leviticus. It's the book of Levites. That's what, that's what it means. Uh, we get our Levitical law from them. And, uh, and I don't know if I completed that thought, but when Moses could not go into the law, uh, go into the promised land because he disobeyed God, he was already a murderer, so he'd broken the law of God. The uh, pastor brought that out this morning when he was reading Stephen's discourse. And, uh, and uh, he'd already been, been a murderer, so he couldn't offer himself to God. And uh, uh, when God said, speak to the rock, and he said, must we fetch the water out of this, uh, and you rebels, and he smoked the rock twice, breaking a picture that God was showing of himself that he was only going to be smitten once. He suffered once for the sins of men. He was not going to, I talked to a Catholic lady, I talked to her years ago, and just uh, recently, uh, I think it was around Thanksgiving time, she stopped in where I work, and she said something, and, uh, and I said, well, you're Catholic, aren't you? Well, I knew that she was Italian, so it was an easy guess, but I said, you're Catholic, aren't you? She goes, yes, and she's talking about the virtues of uh, Catholicism, and I said, well, and it was just in the right time, the Lord brought it to my mind, it says every priest. Now the priest was a Jewish priest in Hebrews, but the Catholics 
when I started reading the Bible, they stole everything they got from, the, uh, from Judaism. They stole it all. The mitre, the fair mitre, and all that stuff, all the clo- I was an altar boy. They, would, uh, uh, they had to put their vestments on in a specific way, just like Aaron did. They, they stole all that. And so, uh, but I remembered that uh, verse of scripture from Hebrews. And I said, you go read Hebrews, read it. I said, don't let somebody read the Bible for you. Your soul's in the balance, not your priest. Your soul is in the balance. And you're going to spend eternity, whether you, re- whether you accept him or reject him. And the decision's already made. If you won't accept him, you have rejected him. So it's a decision that God will force you to make. Somebody, does, somebody may influence your decision, but you'll ultimately make that decision. Every person does. God says, choose you. Didn't say choose ye. When he says ye in the Bible, he's talking to the masses. When he says you, he's talking to the individual. And he says, choose you this day who you'll serve. That's your choice. That's your choice. And you're given choices every day. And um, uh, I said... It says in Hebrews, read it. Read it in your Catholic Bible. Every priest standeth daily, often offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Because God will only accept one sacrifice, and that is when Jesus said, it is finished. God was satisfied. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Now, he says, so we have these six uh, 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 people going up there and they're given a blessing. And then he has them on uh, Mount Ebal and you have Reuben. Now, Reuben was the firstborn, but he lost his firstborn right. And you know who it was given to? Judah. Judah. I'm telling you. Isn't it? And, you know, it was, it, was, um, it was Judah that wanted to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. It was Reuben that wanted to see if he could free him later on. But he went up to his father's couch and defiled it. See? Uh, The Bible says that. You know, and I'm not going to read everything here, and I'm going to tell you why I'm not going to read everything here. Uh, I thought my grandchildren would be here tonight, and I determined that already. But I'm not going to read everything here uh, because of young people. But you read it. Uh, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why. There's a scriptural reason. We'll get into that in a minute here. But uh, the, then, then you have uh, Gad. Now, Reuben and Gad were sons of Leah. Why are they on Mount Ebal? Well, uh, oh, uh, no, wait a minute. Reuben and Dan. Uh, Reuben, Gad, and Dan. Now, I'm just, this is just an observation from just going through the Bible without a really in-depth study of it on what I'm saying right now. You had Reuben. He went up to his father's couch and defiled it. And you have that in, uh, I think it's in Genesis chapter uh, 49 where, where, uh, uh, where uh, uh, Jacob is giving the blessings and he's prophesying about what will happen to him. Uh, you have uh, Gad when you had the, uh, you had uh, 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 Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh and what was the other tribe? I know it, it's, uh, is it? It wasn't Reuben, was it? When they wanted to stay on the other side of the, when they were going into the promised land and they found that great pasture land for their cattle and Moses, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Joshua was, or Moses was, uh, was upset with them. And he says, hey, your brothers are going to go to war. You're going to weaken their spirits. And they said, no, we'll go to war before them. But they stayed on the wrong side. God didn't give them that side. That was something that they took. You know, you have what is what I've heard called, and I'm not really comfortable with it, but it's called, but they've called it the permissive will of God. The reason why I'm not uh, 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 comfortable with it is because it doesn't talk about in the Bible and use those words, the permissive will of God. But apparently we have a permissive will of God. He's not going to interfere with you uh, with what you're doing. You, you see this in the history of Israel when you have a good king and it'll say something like, nevertheless, the high places were not taken away. They were not pleasing to God. Now, they did a great revival. They took care of all the idols. They got rid of the sodomites and all of that stuff. And they really cleaned house. But nevertheless, the high places weren't taken away. See, and, and you know, isn't that true with the rest of us? We, 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 we want to uh, present our bodies a living sacrifice. We just don't want to burn our elbow or something we want to hold on to that seems to be precious to us. We're willing to burn everything else, and it might be a good sacrifice, but we just still want to hold on to something. 
Nevertheless, the high places are not taken away. So you have Gad, and he stayed over there. Now, you have to remember when Jesus, when Jesus went into and opened up the ministry to Jerusalem, and he preached the gospel. The gospel was the kingdom of God is at hand. A Syrophoenician woman comes up to Jesus, and she begs and intercedes for her child. And he said, Jesus says, it's not right to give the bread for the children to the dogs. <laughs> you know, that's an amazing thing. That's what Jesus told this woman. You know what she said? A Syrophoenician, a Greek woman. She said, truth, Lord, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fell from the man. I'm telling you, that's what we were. Yeah. Yeah. So... He said, I am not sent, but to the house to the uh, house of Israel. That's what Jesus said. That woman came to him and he said, it's not right. I'm sent to the house of Israel. He presented the gospel to his own. He came unto his own, John chapter 1, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, to them that believe on his name. So there, but you have Jesus going over to Gad. He went over to the Gadarene maniac. The maniac did not ask for help. Jesus went over to him. Do you know why? Because he was of the tribe. He was of Israel. He was of Israel. And he went there. And he said, what's your name? He said, Legion, for we are many. And he told, the man, told him to come out of the man, went up to a herd of uh, 2,000 pigs. Uh, you know, and I like what somebody said. I heard that early on when I was saved. He said the pigs had better sense. They went out and choked themselves where a man just invited them in, you know. Well, I don't know that they invited them in. And you had that, too, about playing around with God. When I think it's in Luke when Jesus said it's like a man whose house is swept and empty and garnished, but he didn't. He didn't accept Jesus Christ as his Savior. And the demon that was in him, he walks out in the dry, and he says, I know what I'll do. I'll go back where I came from. And he goes back, and he finds it empty, swept, and garnished, and he brings seven more demons, more wicked than himself. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And you have that in uh, where Peter says that it had been better for you never to hear the gospel than to hear it and turn from that holy commandment. And they're like the dog that returns to its vomit and the sow that was washed to its wallowing in the mire. You, 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 listen, if you think that this is just a Sunday evening service and I'm supposed to say what I'm saying and you're not responsible to God for what he has said in his book, you are wrong. Right. You are wrong. God will hold me and you accountable for what we're looking at in this word. Right. So then you have Dan. And I'm just looking at this from an observation. The other ones are the children of the concubines. Now, to me, that shows that even though, uh, uh, very frankly, that uh, Jacob not only had sex with his two wives, but with their uh, handmaidens too, and they became the 12 patriarchs. God doesn't approve of it. God doesn't approve of it. And how do you know that? He didn't seem like he slapped them down for it. God said right from the outset, from a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, shall leave their, and they'll cleave, and they shall be one flesh. Not many, one flesh. That was God's design from the get-go, and I'm glad it is. You know why? Because I'm a part of the bride of Christ. And there's going to be, there's going to be uh, that... Uh, that, um, uh, uh, well, we're not going to have to worry about playing second fiddle to Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, he's, there's that faithfulness. There's not going to be that duplicity. There's not going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, the infidelity. There's not, not going to be any of that at, after the marriage uh, of the Lamb. I'm telling you, we, and, and, and the Bible says, I hath not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the hearts of men the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. We, we can, in our loftiest and our holiest imagination of what that is like, we haven't even jumped up to touch the bottom of it yet. I mean, we just can't do that. Uh, it's so much greater. And why? Because it's the God that created the universe that said it's going to happen. 
Now, so then you have uh, uh, Dan. Now, Dan, what was the... Uh, what was the fault? Well, the fault that I see with Dan, I, you know, in, in Israel, if we say, well, everything from the top to the bottom, well, the saying in Israel was from everything from Dan to Beersheba. In other words, from the top of, of Israel, to the uttermost part of the top to the uh, southernmost was from Dan to Beersheba. Now, what about Dan? Well, when the, when the, um, when the uh, kingdom split under Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and Jeroboam was given 10 tribes, and they went north. And Jeroboam knew that his life would be forfeit because there was several uh, uh, feast days uh, for the Israelites to go to Jerusalem. And if the northern tribes went to Jerusalem, there was the opportunity of reunification, and his life would be forfeit. So he said, it is too much for thee, O Israel, to go to Jerusalem. And he devised the day of his own heart, and he set up an altar in Bethel, the house of God, and he set one way up in Dan. Now you can read that there, but when you, when you, when you come to the conclusion, it says they all went to Dan. Why? Why did they all go to Dan? Wasn't Bethel even more centrally located? Why did they go to Dan? It's because the people who profess to be God's people want to live so far on the perimeter so that they can get enough of the world and still think that they're God's people. What? I mean, they all went to Dan. The Bible said that. They didn't stay in Bethel. It's too much of a reminder that it was God's house. All right, now, now look at this in here. Now there's 12 curses, and this is why I'm not going to read all of this. Verse 14 again, And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice. I, you know, I should remember that. I've even got it underlined in here from 08. But um, I should remember that when, when the people on the street, the biggest complaint they have, it's not because we're loud, that's what they say. It's because it's the word of God and they hate it because it cuts them to the heart just like it did in, in Acts chapter 5 and as we looked in Acts chapter 7 this morning. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. But it's said with a loud voice. I always go to the one in Isaiah and I think it's 58. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Now, uh, And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the... Oh, okay, that's the one I was looking for. And the Levites shall speak and say unto all the men of Israel with a loud voice, Cursed be the man that maketh any graven or molten image an abomination unto the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth, uh, and, and putteth it in secret places, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is he that setteth light by his father and mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he that removeth his neighbor's landmark, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed be he that perverteth the judgment of the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, and all the people shall say amen. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of that, and you can read it, and you'll see why. Because God said to say it to all the men. And I'm, ta I'm telling you, when, and we're going to look at a little bit in the next chapter here, too. But uh, uh, there are some absolutely, and I don't know why we would call them revolting, because we are revolting. You say, well, I'm not. Well, you put yourself in a position of Isaiah, who was a pretty good guy for the first five chapters, until chapter six, and he said, woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the land of people of unclean lips. And he laid down in, in, in the dirt. Why? Why? What did he do? Fall into sin? Did he, did he, did he uh, 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 just do some outlandish thing? No, no. He saw the holiness of God. Yeah. He saw the holiness of God and it reflected his filth on his, on his own self. You read the rest of that chapter and you read Deuteronomy 28. And I'm going to read parts of it here because I think it should be said. 
the Jews in Jesus' day, I, I think this is, this is one of the most horrifying things. And I'm not trying to be um, over explicit here when I say that. I think this is the one of the most horrifying things that was said in the Bible. Pilate says to him, shall I crucify your king? And they say, we have no king but Caesar. You think that was horrible? I think it was absolutely horrible. And they said, uh, I'm cleansed from the blood of this man. And they said, let his blood be on us and on our children. And I think they added the word forever. They didn't look down the annals of time and see the Holocaust. They, I saw uh, uh, Steven Spielberg had a, 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 a documentary. It wasn't a great documentary, but they interviewed people, SS soldiers and, everybody, and other people who were in these death camps that were still alive and thriving in Germany. Uh, this was a number of years ago I saw it, and it was called Shoah. It's the, it's the Hebrew word for annihilation. And these people talked about these people going into the gas chamber. They were first-hand events of things that happened there. They weren't glorified by Hollywood. They were first-hand events of things that they talked about people when that Zylon, gas B, Zylon B gas was emitted when they thought they were getting showers. And when these people who, who clawed each other to get to the top to get fresh air, when it took them almost pry bars to get them apart. Just naked bodies, dead from, uh, I mean, and that was some of the mild things. Some of the, I mean, in the crematoriums, and I'm not trying to be disgusting here, but what I am saying is when they said, let his blood be on us and our children, they did not look down into the future and see what they were actually saying. We're going to read some of this in here. I mean, and it is revolting, but this is a warning from God. And we'll look at something in the book of Hebrews that brings it up to date for us. Now, I want to read this and write in here in verse 28. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt uh, hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord, the God, to observe and do all these commandments, which I command, me, uh, command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee if thou shalt hearken unto uh, the voice of the Lord thy God. The things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, right? This was written aforetime. If we hearken to God, we get blessings. Now, you say, uh, well, it didn't work out so well for them because nationally when somebody went bad, it cost other people their lives. And that's true in some respects because you have Achan who went up and went into Jericho and he saw Babylonian garment and, and some uh, 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 silver or whatever it was there. And he took it and he hid it under his own tent. And when they went up to Ai, 36 people lost their lives because of Achan. They didn't know that. See, so your sin can affect somebody else. Right. Uh, but we'll see that there are exceptions. And you know who the exception is? It's you. Not the person sitting next to you. It's you, if you want it. If you want it. It's what you want out of life. What do you want? Do you want to serve God? Do you want to use God? Do you want God to just uh, leave you alone and let you get by and enjoy this crummy, filthy, maggot-ridden life that we think we're having fun in? I mean, it really isn't anything. Paul said to depart and to be with Christ is far better, yeah. but it's necessary to stay here for you. Now, blessed, and, and the word blessing, and I wrote that down here, let me see. Uh, it's in here, the word bless, blessed, or blessing is in this uh, is in this past in this chapter ten times. Uh, blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shall be, and so it doesn't matter whether you're working in the city or on the farm. God said He'll bless you if what if you put Him first. You know what it says, and I was thinking of that when the pastor was speaking there too, and I looked it up, and in uh, 
uh, Joshua, uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy heart, uh, uh, for therein thou shalt meditate in it day and night. Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Meditate. That means you're thinking about it day and night. And uh, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy uh, heart, for thou shalt meditate in it day and night, and then thou shalt be prosperous and uh, and then thou shalt have good success. I didn't say it right, but it's in uh, Joshua chapter 1. Read it. And God, that's a promise from God. Uh, good success. There's nothing wrong with success. I mean, it depends on what uh, God calls success. Uh, uh, blessed shalt be the fruit of the body, uh, the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of the kind and the flocks, and of thy sheep. Verse 5, blessed shalt thou be the basket, and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thee. Thou shalt come out against thee one way, and, and before thee seven ways. Last week, um, I noticed outside my house there was 13 police cars that uh, I, from my picture when I could see it, I counted them. There was 13 police cars because I pray for their situation wherever they're going, you know, for salvation and for safety for them and for wherever they're going. But I saw 13 of fire trucks and police cars going by with their lights on. And I was wondering, what in the world is going on? So I tried to look up online. Well, it was something about a hero or something for Christmas or some, something like that. But anyway, uh, but... Uh, when I was looking up there, I realized that there was a murder uh, down in the uh, in the uh, trailer park not far from where I live, and there was another murder over here. And I'm thinking, man, are you kidding? I live around here. God says 10,000 can drop at your right hand, but it won't touch you. You know, 1,000 on your right side, 10,000 on your left side. God said, but it won't. Nothing, nothing, nothing is ever going to touch you without going through God first. And if it goes through God, it's going to get his grace going along with it before it touches you. I'm confident of that. Uh, the Lord shall command the blessing upon thee in the storehouse and in all the, that thou settest thine hand unto, and he shall uh, bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee and a holy people unto himself uh, as, he that, uh, as he has sworn unto thee. Now, listen, folks. If God swears to something, you don't take it lightly. It says that in Hebrews. Because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. I mean, he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. So when God swears to something, I mean, his, he, God said he would, in Psalms 138 too, it's a good verse, look it up. Uh, he will magnify his word above all of his name. Not just his name, but above all of his name. Pastor uh, mentioned tonight in prayer, I think, Jehovah Jireh. You know, he's got different, uh, uh, different aspects to his name for different defenses for us and for different blessings for us. And his main, and name means something a little bit different uh, in each situation. And I like that where, uh, where uh, uh, Martin Luther said, Lord Sabaoth, his name. Not Lord Sabbath, Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age the same in, uh, in a Mighty Fortress. The Lord Sabaoth means the God of where did I get that lint from? Warfare. The God of warfare. The Lord Sabaoth his name. And if it was somebody that needed a God that was a good God at warfare, it was Martin Luther standing up against. And he's coming out of the dark ages. I know more about the Bible than Martin Luther did. You said, well, that's very proud of you to say so. No, it's just taking it by faith. God said in the last days, uh, knowledge will be increased. I'm not in competition with uh, Martin Luther because if I was, I would lose God used him. The world has heard of him. The world has never heard of me. I'm confident and I'm content that Jesus Christ has heard of me. After that, you have known God, and it says in the book of Galatians, or rather are known of God. I don't care who knows about me as long as Jesus knows about me. Amen. Now, it says, the Lord shall establish thee and holy people unto himself, and he hath sworn unto thee, if thou shalt keep 
thy commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways and all the people of the earth shall uh, see thee that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. I'm not going to read any more in there. We're going to go uh, a little further on in this chapter and look at some things uh, about the curses. But if you read the blessings in here and the curses, the curses are almost three times longer and when, he's, when you read this chapter, there's more about the curses, although the word curse is only, I think, about 10 times. But the, 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 the curse, the extent of it, is like three times greater than the blessings. I always think of that in relationship to Galatians chapter 5. It says, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, and revelings, and such like. Now, if you take that last classification of such like, you have 18 categories. That's against the fruit of the spirit is singular. But the aspects of them are nine. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. So there's a greater manifestation of the flesh against God than there is of the spirit towards God. Yeah. Satan has relentless. I mean, we, we mentioned that a number of times, and you see that in the book of Job, where uh, when God calls attention, not that Satan wasn't aware of him, but when God calls attention to Job, and, and Satan says, yeah, well, he's got everything he wants. Why should he curse you? He said, okay, you can take it. So he took one day, in one day, and uh, the Sabaeans came down and they took all the camels. And then another group came down and took all the asses and all that. And then, and, and, and there was only one servant that escaped. That, that bad news isn't any good unless it gets to uh, Job. So Satan lets one person escape kills everybody else and lets one person escape and he tells them that's very that's what the Ninevites did the Ninevites were cruel I mean they were cruel cruel people in profane history they're they're cruel I mean they were and and so what they would do when they would go on a march they would let they would decimate a village or, or, or and, and 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 brutally savagely torture people and they'd let one person escape you know why because he'd go to the next village and he would tell them about all these horrific things that were happening and then when they would go in there they'd just get the spoils you know why because they committed suicide that's what you had up on Masada, when there was only, I think, five people that, uh, after Titus uh, finally stormed uh, Masada, there was only, I think, five people alive because they committed suicide. They would have suffered a lot of atro atrocities uh, by the Romans. And so they went, uh, they did that, and, uh, and, and so uh, one person escapes, and he gives, and, and, and the Bible says it like this. While he was yet speaking, another servant came gave him more bad news. While he was yet speaking, another servant came and gave him more bad news. While he was yet speaking, the other one came with the coup de grace and said, thy seven sons and thy three daughters were in the pavilion. A great wind from the north came and killed them all. And what, is, what does Job do? He doesn't wring his hands and say, why God? He shaved his head, took his clothes off, put in sackcloth and ashes, sat in the dust and said, I came into this world naked. I'll go on out naked. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now I'm yeah. telling you, yeah. this is before he had, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. And we're going to see why that applies to us more than it does to Job when we get to Hebrews here shortly. Now, now, then God goes into the cursings. He's given these blessings. Now, God is as good as his word on both cases. On the blessing, if you want it. On the cursings, if you want to disobey him. You're not going to escape. You're not going to outsmart God. I mean, we, if anything would tell us that, it would be uh, uh, Adam and Eve. When, when she saw that the tree was good for fruit, a tree, a tree to be desired to make one wise. And he already promised them that they'd be like gods. They became cowards. They hid themselves, not gods. And they didn't become wise. They became fools, right? I mean, they didn't become wise. 
And if, and if we can't get it from there, and then God's got all these other things that says, listen, if you obey me, this will be the blessing. It's not that you're going to have a life of luxury. You're still going to, if you're going to be blessed in the fields, what does that mean? You're going to have to work those fields, right? Right? Still going to have to pull weeds. But the other people are doing it, and they're not doing it with the blessings of God, and they're getting thorns in their hands, and they're still not getting any crop. I tell you, it's a, uh, uh, the Bible talks about the laboring man. We mentioned that this morning in Sunday school, the sleep of the laboring man is sweet. See? Uh, but uh, God gives us a satisfaction in producing something in our life. No matter what he's given you, I don't care if you're a, a, a pencil pusher, a, 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 a meter reader, or you restore furniture like I, and people say, well, man, how do you like that? I absolutely love it. I hope in heaven there's a repair shop somewhere like we're going to really need one. But anyway, uh, but you know, I mean, I just love, and God, whatever he's given you a gift for, you love doing it. I mean, you just love doing it. Beethoven, profoundly deaf. He had to cut the legs off the piano, set it on the floor when they were composing the fifth symphony so that he could feel the vibration of the notes and at the premiere of, of, the, of the fifth symphony in that great hall, the applause was so thunderous he could not hear it. It was the first chair violin had to get up and turn him around so he could see the standing ovation and bow to the crowds. Couldn't even hear that thunderous applause. But he had something that he could see music. He could, I can't see it. Uh, uh, um, uh, I watched a documentary on Michelangelo, and he could see the David in a hunk of stone. I couldn't see it. I do like what he said. I heard this, and I don't know how accurate it is, uh, because I relate it to myself, not that I'm elevating myself to that level, but uh, uh, because when I work on something, I said, uh, uh, they, you know, if, if they want to know why I'm taking a long time, I said, well, I think uh, Michelangelo had an apprentice, and the apprentice said to Michelangelo, he says, uh, he said, look, what are you done? He was working on a sculpture. He says, I'm never done. They just come and take it away. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. You know, because you're never going to find satisfaction. When you get closer to perfection, we know what you see, imperfection. I tell people the only place you can find perfection is in the dictionary, and the definition is it ain't there. <laughs> so, but we still strive for it. Do you know why? Because God has put it in our heart that there's something better than what we can achieve. And there is something better. And I think in eternity, it's going to be in a state of constant new. It's not like, oh, well, we've seen that before. You know, oh, we've been there for a thousand million years or whatever. Uh, no, it's going to be a constant state of new. And we're just going to be going, oh, oh, oh. probably before we can get an amen out, we'll have 15 billion years of gasping. Uh, but anyway, now, now I want to read this in here because it hits every strata of society. Uh, right here, and I'm going to start in verse um, uh, 54. So that the man that is of, of uh, Deuteronomy 28, so that the man that is tender among you, doesn't sound very manly, but the man that is tender among you, and the reason why I want to say that is because we are talking about high society here. We're not talking about uh, low lives when we look at these. The man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eye shall be evil towards his brother and towards the wife of his bosom and toward the uh, remnant of his children, which he, shall leave, which he shall leave, so that he will not give to any of them of the flesh of his children whom he shall... And I'm telling you, folks, I know... There's other things that I haven't read in here that are, that are revolting. And, I, and, and God said to say these to men. But here, right in here, that, he, that they shall leave. In, during World War II, there was a lot of cases of unreported uh, cases of cannibalism in Europe. I, I, you say that cannot happen. Well, let's take God's word for it. Let me just read here because uh, it says right in here in verse um, 56. 
and a tender and delicate woman among you, which would not adventure to set the sole of her foot upon the ground for delicateness and tenderness, her eyes shall be evil toward the husband of her bosom and toward her sons and toward her daughter and toward her young ones that cometh out from between her feet and toward the children which she shall bear, for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness wherewith thine enemies shall uh, distress thee in the gates. And if thou, wilt not, if thou wilt not observe to do all the words of the law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear the glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, then the Lord will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed, even great plagues, and, uh, and of long continuance, and sore sickness, and of long continuance. Listen, folks, you cannot fight God and win. You can't do it. I mean, I mean, if, if that's the simplicity of this message here, you cannot fight God and win. You're going to win if you serve God. You might get uh, beat up a little bit on the way, but I tell you what, I would rather meet Jesus Christ, my Savior, with a few scars than going up there uh, uh, like a lily-livered nothing uh, and, and just come up there unscathed. I'm not a masochist. I don't enjoy pain, but I'll tell you one thing. I want to serve. God has given me the same thing he's given you, and that is a gift, and it's the gift of time where we can serve God by faith. After this life, you're not going to have that opportunity again. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, I want to conclude here in a minute, uh, but I want to look at um, uh, Hebrews 10.29 first. Oh, let's go on over to uh, Psalm 78. We're in the Old Testament. Psalm 78. You know, when Jesus was in his hometown, the Bible says that he did not many mighty works there. Why? Because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. In Psalms 79, uh, verse 41, Yea, they turned back and tempted God. Now we're looking at this. This is after they're in the land. And they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Is God limited by anything? Only by your unbelief. Only by your unbelief. Now let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. And I'm going to read a few uh, verses in there in Hebrews. Because we are ending this year, 2018, we're going into a new year, which marks time, we, our time is passing, and all that, and, and, and we believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And I believed that for over 45 years. I mean, I really believe that. I never believed that we'd see the next year. Uh, uh, God knows my heart. I'm telling you the truth. I never did. Now, but if we believe Jesus is coming soon, then we must be aware of all the negative aspects that bring that about. And that, in fact, we'll be hitting some of that in Sunday school when we uh, start chapter 4 of 1 John next week. Uh, but uh, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see where they are of God. For many false prophets are uh, in the world. Of, and 1 John is the only place I believe, I'm going from memory here, that is the only place that Antichrist is used in the Bible. And he says, even now are there many Antichrists in the world. And if things are waxing worse and worse, and evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse, then if we believe Jesus Christ is coming soon, then our our, our our uh, antennas ought to be up and our, and our sensors ought to be so keen to anything that would dissuade us from serving God. No matter how subtle, no matter how religious, no matter how spiritual it sounds, we need to be careful. We need, we need to be careful and try those things. Now, here's one of the things. Now, first of all, just look around. I mean, a lot of people don't like to look around in church, but just look around. Yeah, just look around. Okay, I had to fix my fly. No, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I didn't even think I'd say that, but I had to get Fred awake. <laughs> I don't think he heard me anyway. No, but you look around, and uh, look at this right in here. It says, uh, 
Let me start in verse 22. Let us draw near with a uh, true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with uh, pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So, you know, if, when it says that, it seems like we have to take a militant stand on holding fast, right? Uh, the Bible does say in, in uh, Galatians 5.1, uh, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. And I've said that a number of times. It is a military command. It's one I used to make fun of in boot camp because I would say when the, when the company commander wasn't looking and they would say, Stand fast. I would say, how do you do that? And then I would just start vibrating in the same spot. But that doesn't mean that. It means that you militarily hold your ground. If the, if the enemy comes, you don't tuck tail and run. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Verse 24, and let us uh, consider one another to provoke. You know what? The Bible says, uh, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. When people are provoked to serve God and provoked unto good works, you know the word provoke actually even evokes an emotion that you something you don't like, right? Who likes to be provoked? But God tells us to that. And we're supposed to provoke one another. I mean, you know, and, and I looked at that before too, uh, as iron sharpeneth iron. Iron doesn't say to another piece of iron, wow, you look rather shiny today. It doesn't do that. Iron sharpens iron by abrasion, by abrasion, abrasion. And that's rubbing up against it the wrong way. Now, uh, let me go on here. Let us hold fast. Uh, the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So when he says without wavering, he's going he's gonna to give us the wherewithal to stand up from the wavering, right? Faithful is he that called you who also will do it, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And let us consider, verse 24, one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Now, what is that phrase, as the manner of some is? First of all, we were instructed not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What does that mean? In a day of apostasy, well, nobody else is going to church, and Believe me, it's a lot more relaxing to sit at home than to, than to sit in a pew and listen to somebody uh, just uh, telling you how bad you are. <laughs> or, well, you know, I, when I was in Chicago one time, these two girls that came on up to me, and I've used this as an illustration before too, two little uh, black girls come on up to me. I mean, and they said, um, and they were holding hands. They're about 14 years old, give or take a year. And they were holding hands, and they said, if we become Christians, will we have to give up each other? I mean, that breaks your heart. Little kids that are in perversion already at that age, that's a heartbreak. That is a heartbreak. But the point I was getting at, if I would have said yes, they would have walked away from me. If I would have said no, they would have ran away from me knowing I was lying. People do not ask you a question on those bases where they don't know the answer already. They already know the answer. And I had a really good time to talk to them, and they were very respective, and I gave them the gospel. I'm not going to go into all that. It would take up more time than you want to hear. But, but it, was a, it was a good thing, and I still pray for those girls. That was years ago. I don't know their name, but when I said, I, I will say this, not in their defense, but as an understanding of where they were, when I said to them, I said, look, when you were a little girl, and your mother brought you home in her arms and she looked at you and do you think, do you think for a moment that your mom would have thought that you would grow up into this perversion? And as soon as I said that, the one girl says, my grandfather's gay and the other one said her aunt was gay or a relative, you know, was, they're not gay, they're sodomites. Nothing gay about that at all. I mean, in the true definition of the word. But growing up in an environment with that kind of perversion only your imagination can dictate the horror that they must have experienced. God, Jesus said, who is God, 
It'd been better for them for a millstone to be hanged around their neck and cast into the deepest part than to offend a little one. God's holding account for that. Now, it says, not forsaken the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so much the more means that we ought to exhort people to be faithful. Now, how can you do that? Are you going to go around to the people that you don't see here uh, in, 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 on uh, Sunday evening and say on to them Sunday morning, come on, come on out to church Sunday night? Well, that'd be all right. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think you can exhort them with your life. You know, not just being a run-of-the-mill, Sunday-go-to-meeting, uh, professing Christian. I mean, that there's something alive in you that they want. I know that the fellow that witnessed to me back in March of 1971, I never seen that guy before. I never seen him afterwards, but I knew he had something that I wanted desperately. And I say this in all reality, if I could have put a gun on him and got it from him, I'd have done it. It was the Holy Spirit. You can't do that. You can't rob the Holy Spirit. But the thing of it is, I, he had something that I wanted. And God used that. Now, uh, and, and so much more as you see the day approaching. What, what day approaching? The day of, uh, as we're living in it today, we're living in a day of apostasy. And we need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, just on a natural, broad scope of things, if I was to look at over all the population of the earth today and I could see them with one glance, 7.5 or 6, 7 billion people on the face of the earth today, how many of them do you think would stand out to me as being significant? None of them. None of them. I would just see a mass of human bodies. None of them would stand out to me. But if there's a few, few people stand out to me. Listen, if the world doesn't want to serve God, at least ways God's recognizing me. And he sees me wanting to live for him. But he's an infinite God. He sees us all as an individual. And he looks at not only 7.7 .7 or even 12 billion people. And I think there was many more at the time before the flood because it was more landmass and the whole earth was filled with violence and the imagination of the heart was only evil continually. What was the evil? It was all sex. Didn't even mention drunkenness. If God was aware of every one of them and the myriads, I mean, I don't think we have enough zeros on any of the best calculators we have today that could tell us how many intelligences are out there in space that God has. Seraphims, teraphims, uh, all of, I, I don't even know how to spell them, much less understand what they look like, but they're all God's created intelligences. And they're not confined to this little peanut planet that we're on in a little peanut solar system called the Milky Way. We're talking about an infinite God. Now, if you want to if you want to live for God, God will certainly recognize you. And it was brought out today that Jesus, when he when he died on the cross and rose again he forever sat at the right hand of the father but when Stephen stood up for Jesus then Jesus stood up for Stephen I don't like that I don't like that I mean uh, you know he just recognizes all of those things you're not going to prove your love for him just by uh, being a Sunday go to meet and bench warmer you're going to be you're going to be proving your love for him by standing in opposition and all you have to do is stand up for Christ and you're in opposition to the world in fact we read that in first John this morning the world knoweth us not because it knew him not and what does that mean it didn't want to know him when they when they knew him they glorified him not as God but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened they did not want to know God even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge now it says but if you if we sin uh, willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins and let me go down to uh, Hebrews 10, 29. I'll read it through there, verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour, uh, devour the adversaries. The Bible says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Verse 28, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now, here's the point. 
we just read about the Old Testament. That was written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Those things that we read in the Old Testament, the warning in Deuteronomy and everything, and it says in the application to us, listen to this in verse 29, of how much sore, sore, I didn't even know that that was a word, of how much sore punishment, I mean, I knew it was in the Bible, but of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was um, uh, sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. God, since the death, burial, and resurrection, holds us to a higher standard than he did the Israelites back in the book of Deuteronomy and back in their history, even when they went into the promised land. Now, the encouragement. It doesn't matter if the whole world turns religiously hellbound. Doesn't mean you have to. Doesn't mean I have to. Why? Because you have uh, Israel going into the promise. Before they get into the promised land, they send uh, 12 spies in there. 10 came back with an evil report. Joshua and Caleb, and God changed Joshua's name from Hoshea, son of Nun, to Joshua. And he changed it to Joshua because if you, if you take the Hebrew word of Jesus in the New Testament, which is Greek, from Jesus, and you translate it into Hebrew, it is Yeshua, Joshua. That's who Jesus is. And he's the one that's leading us now. But you have uh, Joshua and Caleb, and they did not go along with the other ten spies. All that generation from 20 years old and upward, except for Joshua and Caleb, perished in the wilderness. You know, I think of, too, just now, uh, you know, and we use this uh, sometimes out there in the street, say, uh, you know, well, nobody else believes you and everything. You know, everybody else is doing this and everybody else is doing that. And I said, well, I used to say to my mom when I was a kid, I said, can I do this? And, I said, and she said, no. And I said, well, everybody else is doing it. And she said, well, if they all jumped off a bridge. Well, that's the way religion is today. Religion is going to hell on a stick. And we are following suit. The Protestants, Baptists historically are not Protestants, but Protestants who came out of Catholicism are back in with them. They're, I mean, they're neck and neck right now. Uh, they're, they're all going, and do and you know what uh, Catholicism, and, and it's called that, it's identified his, uh, uh, geographically. If you take offense with it, your offense is with God, not with me. But historically, I mean, and geographically, you have the seven hills of Rome, the only place on the face of the earth. And you have the great whore that sitteth on the seven hills. That's the Catholic Church. And the great whore, and what does the great whore do? It, it, it seduces people. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert would pervert. You know what a moral pervert is? A religious pervert is infinitely worse. They would pervert. How is that? Matthew 23, you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You neither go in yourselves, and those that would go in, you hinder. You compass sea and land to make one proselyte. When you have, you made him twofold more, the child of hell yourselves. And I'll finish with this in, in, in Galatians chapter 1. But though we, Paul said, but though we, the apostles, but though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any of the gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The word accursed means let him drop into hell fire. And that's inspired by God, let them go to hell. As we said before, so say I now again, if any preach any of the gospel unto you, the that you have received, let him be accursed. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement, for the warning, for the understanding, and Father, for the realization that your return is imminent. Help us to be faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.